Welcome, book nerds. Today, I'm interviewing author Samantha Downing about her debut thriller, My Lovely Wife. Stay tuned. Hey, everyone. I'm your host, Tamara Ford, and thank you for downloading this week's book chat here on the Shelf Addiction Podcast. Every week, we get bookish with roundtable book discussions, five-minute shelf bites, interviews, and more. Subscribe on your podcatcher of choice so you don't miss out on any of this book nerd awesomeness. If you'd like to email in feedback or questions, reach out to me at info at shelfaddiction.com or call in and leave an internet voice message via SpeakPipe. You can also find me on Twitter and Instagram at Shelf Addiction. The links for everything related to today's episode, including Samantha's social media, are below in the show notes. If you know someone who may enjoy this episode, please share it with them today. Before we get started, let me tell you a bit about today's interview guest. Samantha Downing lives and works in New Orleans, where she is trying to stay cool in the southern heat and write her next novel. My Lovely Wife is her debut novel and has earned praise from authors Harlan Coben, Liv Constantine, Jane Corey, Nick Petrie, Matt Gartner, and more. I had a fun time interviewing Samantha Downing. She is awesome. And I know you'll enjoy learning about her and her novel. Let's jump into the interview. Hey, Samantha, thank you so much for coming on today. Thank you for having me. It's great to be here. Absolutely. I am super excited to talk about your debut novel, My Lovely Wife. But first, I want to talk a little bit about you. So let's start with what you're reading right now. Okay. Uh, What I'm reading right now is I just finished actually a book called Sometimes I Lie by Alice uh, Feeney is her last name, which is a crazy psychological thriller. Um, I'm actually that actually came out last year and I'm preparing for her new one, which comes out next month, I believe. And then I just got the next, the next book of uh, Liv Constantine. She wrote the, they, they, it's two people wrote the other Mrs. Par the last Mrs. Parrish and they, their next book is called last time I saw you. And I'm looking forward to that. Um, uh, but my favorite book that I've read this year is looker by Laura Sims, which is crazy. Um, all of these are thrillers, which is obviously my genre. What makes that your favorite book of the year so far? Um, it's, claustrophobic almost it's so um it almost just feels suffocating it's it's a woman who is obsessed with a famous actress that lives across the street and you're completely in her head and you you don't change to anyone else's perspective so it feels very um very closed in and very psychotic (laughs) oh goodness okay that sounds interesting yeah, it oh it's it's great. And it's not a long novel. It's it's actually rather short, but it's it you're you're kinda you kinda when when you end it, you kinda take a deep breath. <laughs> Whew. Okay. I, oh, it's over. Okay. Right. I made it. <laughs> exactly. That's awesome. So do you think you have any authors that you just, you know, auto buy? Every time a book comes out, you are clicking that buy button without even looking at the description. Um, yes, there are a few, uh, Carolyn Kepneys who wrote you, and I think we've all seen the Netflix show you, um, Mm -hmm. I, I buy everything that she writes, uh, Mary Kubica, another more on psychological thriller. I would say Gillian Flynn, if she wrote more often, if she wrote a book every year, I would buy it every year, but unfortunately she hasn't graced us with another book since Gone Girl. Um, yeah. Kimberly Bell. The other one, I, which is totally out of my genre, whom I first encountered because we have the same agent. Her name is Shelly Ellis. And she writes um, a couple in a couple different genres, but she wrote a romantic novella trilogy set in a dance school. And I love it. I loved it. And they came out at different each. They came out separately. Each novella came out separately. And I was completely addicted to it. It was like the most fabulous soap opera. So Shelly Ellis, she's awesome. (laughs) Oh, that's cool. I just love when I read something that's not my usual go to genre. And I just love it. I love when that happens. Yes, I I love it too. Yeah, I try to read outside of my genre, at least every third book or so. Oh, keep it fresh. Yeah. Cool. Awesome. You know, that also kind of serves as a palate cleanser a little bit. I do that for that too. Absolutely. And especially with thrillers, sometimes you you need to remind yourself the world isn't that dark. 
<laughs> yeah, absolutely. So let's talk a little bit about your writing style. Um, since this is your first novel and you've read a ton of books, do you have any like specific books or authors that you think may have inspired you? Um, definitely. I would say the first one is um, the classic Rebecca by Daphne du Maurier. Uh, that absolutely inspired me. That is the character of Rebecca never appears in the book. Um, but the narrator is an unnamed narrator. And she has she's the second wife of someone who's uh, whose first wife was named Rebecca and big shoes to fill. So we constantly are seeing Rebecca only through the stories that people tell about her. So that was a big inspiration in how I designed this book. Um, another one with an unnamed narrator that people don't think about a lot because of how the story plays out is the fight club that mm. the, um, mm-hmm. that's an unnamed narrator. The only name we ever know is Tyler Durden. So it, we never actually learn Ed Norton's real name in the movie. Um, so it, it's interesting. It's fat. It's a fascinating um technique, I think. Yeah, I'm so glad to hear that. Because I was mentioning earlier that I had just, you know, finished your book, and I really enjoyed it. But when I finished, I'm like, did I miss what the husband's name was? I'm like, how did I did I miss that? And I'm like, what's going on? So you kind of use that technique in your book as well. Absolutely. Um, He is an unnamed narrator. And we see um, his wife, his lovely wife only through his eyes we don't ever get her perspective and i i very much wanted the book to be that i i, th- I think that's the way that we know people in general we ne- you never really get into somebody's head you know them only through your interactions with them so i wanted you to see his wife that way and make your own opinion about who she is or what she is when you get to the end of the story and then you can have your own opinion but you sh- you, you never get her inside of her head in the story. It's Mm -hmm. just him. You know, and at first I kind of wondered, like, I wonder why she chose to go with one POV versus, you know, back and forth. Because, you know, as a reader, I'm like, I wonder, because I had a couple of things floating in my mind. You guys are not going to spoil anything. Don't worry. But I'm like, I think if you had the multiple, multiple, you know, POV, that might have kind of given more away. So is that the reason why you kind of decided to just go with only the one? Um, Yeah, there were a couple reasons. There's a lot of um, thrillers these days that do have the multiple POV and also the back and forth um, just between two people. And Mm -hmm. I I didn't feel I had anything new to bring to the table on that. So I it would um, just be more of a repetition of what's already been done. I don't have any new ideas for that. And second, I think being in one person's head keeps it keeps the story tight um, in terms of how much a reader knows and how much you allow them to know. And in a psychological thriller, that's really important. When you flip perspectives, you have to have the other side of the story almost, and then find a way to build suspense while flipping back and forth. So um, Mm -hmm. for me, I I prefer to stay in some one person's head. Yeah, well, I I think it was excellently done the way you did it. I'm like, oh, my gosh, I just really enjoyed it. Um, But I would like to ask when you were planning or, you know, thinking about what you wanted to do for this novel, because obviously you're writing from a man's point of view. Did you (laughs) like how did you prepare to write from a husband's point of view when clearly you're a woman? So how did that work out for you? Right. Um. Well, I don't plot and I don't plan. So I just oh. start writing and I, my ideas come to me like I, like one at a time. Each chapter gives me the idea for the next chapter. And then at the end, of course, I have to do a lot of re- revision and make sure it's all cohesive. But I found that, um, I'm not a chess player. I can't plan 200 steps in advance. I'm much better one step at a time and I get better ideas that way. I get to, I get to, I can expand the story as I go. And it's more fun for me because that's uh, uh, what's exciting to me is discovering the story. Um, So I didn't really plan. (laughs) I just sort of started writing. (laughs) That is awesome. Cause I'm like, that was a lot of like interesting how like it all kind of melded back together and things tied up, even though you didn't do any planning for it. Yeah. Well, yeah. I mean, there is a revision and luckily I have a great editor who says, you know, make sure this all ties together. <laughs> <laughs> <So>. <laughs> yeah. It's not completely 
doesn't it doesn't come out that way the first time I write it. <laughs> okay, well, let's go ahead and share like the um, high level, you know, uh, synopsis of what's going on with this book in case you know those that are out there don't know what the book is about. We've already started, but let's go <laughs> back and tell them what the book is about. So, if you wouldn't mind, Samantha, sure. Um, I think of this as a thriller about marriage. Um, and it is about a couple who has been married 15 years. They have two teenage kids and they get a little bored. And so they spice up their marriage in a very extreme, violent way, <laughs> basically. And, um, that's what it's about. And, and they are the people next door. Truly, they live in a gated community, a suburban upscale country club gated community. They might be people you've met. They might be parents of people your kids go to school with. And I think that's what, what makes it so, um, uh, there's so many people relate to it. I've had people say to me, you, uh, I love the book, but I don't ever want to live next door to you. <laughs> Oh my gosh, right? Anybody like that, you want to side eye your neighbors right now. Like what is going on over there? Because like for me, I live in like a little cookie cutter, right. exactly. <laughs> you know, suburban little, you know, neighborhood. And I'm like, uh, uh-uh, these people, some of them are psychopaths. You just don't know it. <laughs> right. Exactly. <laughs> that's how, that's the beauty of being a psychopath. You have a, um, you have this normalcy that you live under otherwise you'd be caught right away right you'd be you yeah. you have to pretend you're normal that's the idea so so i've got to ask you did you do a lot of research about you know serial killers and psychopaths and <laughs> therapy <laughs> things like that <laughs> i did and i have over the years seen the same movies tv shows books that everybody has i mean i think a, a lot of the serial killer stuff has become common knowledge in terms of the profilers and and what they do. And there's been, I don't know how many TV shows about profilers and people that um, track serial killers going all the way back to silence of the lambs, which I think Mm -hmm. first made it very famous. Um, So in terms of that, yeah. And I, I, what one thing I did not want to do in this book is repeat information that most people already know about mm-hmm. serial killers and profiling and things like that. Um, because it, it, if if you're a thriller reader, you already know it anyway. Yeah. Well, for sure. Okay, so I did want to ask a little bit about um, Melissa. Oh my gosh, I can't say your name. Melissa? <laughs> Thank you. Um, I'm so curious about her because... She is completely batty, in my opinion, (laughs) and she's also very, very smart. So smart. So when you were, like, developing her, like, did you draw inspiration from anyone you know? Or, (laughs) (laughs) like, how did she come about? Millicent, I look at as an extreme version of today's superwoman, what we we used to call a superwoman. I don't know if people still say that word, but um, the the wife, the mother, the career woman, um, the one who's got everything in control and on top of everything. She's the most extreme version of that. She's an uber control freak. She has lots of rules in the household and that, and that's not even talking about their extracurricular activities. Just the Mm -hmm. way she runs the household is, you know, somewhere between the military and a drill sergeant. I don't know what it is, but she has a lot of rules and it's easier kind of just to go along than to fight her. (laughs) So I think the family, even for teenagers, it's easier just to just to just do it. And then they can get out of the out of the room as quickly as possible. Um, She's like the scary mom, like Mm -hmm. (laughs) she's going to make you eat broccoli and nothing else. And (laughs) you can't leave the house and everything. It's like, no, absolutely. And um, (laughs) um, well, I, I come from a long line of really independent, strong women. Both of my grandmothers own their own business. Oh, in their own businesses. Um, my parents got divorced when I was three. So I was fundamentally raised by a single woman. But what I do remember, or the story that's been told since I was too young to remember it is when my um, mom and dad, my, we, they were having a dinner party one night. And my dad, he was a kind of a tough guy. And he said, Oh, honey, everything is perfect, except and then oh, no. he, he <laughs> He reeled off the, I don't know what it was. The butter wasn't soft enough. The rolls weren't hot, whatever it was. And my mom picked up a bowl of pasta and dumped it on his head and walked out. 
<laughs> Good for her. That's what he gets. Like, yes, shut right. it. Just eat the food. <laughs> that's right. That's right. And she said to this oh. day, she said, you know, if I had done that more often, maybe we wouldn't have gotten divorced. <laughs> oh, no. Oh, so. my gosh. That's awesome, though. Oh, that's so, an awesome story. <laughs> it is. It, it is a great story. And, and she still says he deserved it. <laughs> he deserved mm-hmm. it. So, yeah, it, when you when you come from women like that, um, you tend to, I think, write strong women. Strong women are the first ones that come to mind and certainly not ones that are being run by a man. Yeah. And nobody is running her, Mm-mm. literally. Mm-mm. No. Yeah. And then uh, the other thing I want to mention was about her name, Millicent. Um, that comes from, oddly enough, the uh, Brady Bunch that is, if anybody oh, really? remembers their Brady Bunch trivia, Millicent, it was, it's the only time I've ever heard the name. Someone told me now it's in Harry Potter, one of the Harry Potter later books, but I'm not familiar with that. Um, I'm a, not all of the books anyway, but the only time I've ever heard the name Millicent is she was the first girl Bobby kissed and she gave him the mumps. Oh my goodness. <laughs> I actually remember him getting the mumps from being kissed, but I didn't remember the name of the character. Mil- and she, you know who it was? It was, uh, she was played by Melissa Sue Anderson, who went on to be in Little House on the Prairie. She played Ma- oh. Mary, the sister Mary. Um, I know there's so many layers of trivia there. I, I- <laughs> wow. I'll tuck that away for later, just in case it ever, you know, comes up in a trivia game or totally, something. Totally. <laughs> Totally. So that's where the name Millicent came up is I just never hear it uh, it's mm-hmm. just, even in, in books even. So, yeah, it's kind of a, a old name mm-hmm. kind of. Mm-hmm. So yeah, for sure. So what did you like least about Millicent? Um, probably her violence. <laughs> <laughs> oh, like she kills people. Yep. Yeah. We hate that. <laughs> yeah, that. That part where she kills people and yeah, yeah there's that. that, that. <laughs> Yeah. And, you know, maybe a little torture involved. I don't know. (laughs) Things like that. (laughs) Yeah. I mean, I was really, like, interested in how multi-layered she was. She had lots of layers. Like, you think one thing, and then you think something else, and then you're back to your original thought. And you're like, oh, man. I mean, honestly, I'm surprised the husband stayed with her for so long. She's crazy. Mm-hmm. And that's awesome. I love it. It was like so entertaining. I think he liked it too. <laughs> he did like it. He secretly liked he it. Liked not it. secretly. No, not secretly. He liked it. <laughs> <laughs> well, what did you like best about his character? Um, I think he he's interesting because he's trying to do, uh, both of them are really, are, but him especially because he's the one we hear from. He's trying to do the best. He, he's trying to be a good father. He's trying to be a good provider. He's trying to be a good husband. He's he's trying to do all the right things in the story. Um, and I don't know if it gets away from him or maybe he was never built to do the right things. It, it's hard to tell with him. Um, but his, you, you get the sense that he he's really trying, and that I think again is something everybody can relate to because every because most people are out there just doing their best they can and trying to mm-hmm. do trying to do the right thing for the most part. Um, mm-hmm. We aren't we aren't all hidden Millicents, <laughs> right? Yeah, but and I think if I try to think what would happen if you know, something happened and then suddenly my spouse is asking me to do crazy things to spice, you know, keep the spice. I'm like, I feel like I think I'm calling the police, but (laughs) to each his own, he handled that differently. (laughs) Right. Exactly. Exactly. And yeah, the one thing I wanted um, to uh, was very deliberate in the book was to have these very normal moments in the family and conversations about schedules, about work, about the kids that everybody has had. Everybody's had these, they, they recognize those conversations either because they've had them or they've heard them or their parents have had them. And then you turn the page and they're doing something horrible. So I wanted that mm. juxtaposition between, oh, I've done this. I've done this. Whoa, no, I haven't done this. <laughs> yeah. And I think it makes it more unsettling that you can relate to these people and then very much not relate to these people. Right. Like, Oh yeah, that's cool. And then, Whoa, 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 Whoa. Yeah. <laughs> that's just crossed <laughs> the line. Cool. That's I not can... cool. Yeah. Not cool. <laughs> 
I mean, and even their kids, um, Jenna and Rory, Rory, they are really interesting characters with a lot going on as well. Even though they're, you know, quote unquote, just the kids, they've got a lot that they do in this book. Yes. Um, I, I definitely wanted kids that were older instead of toddlers that really have no storyline yet other than, I don't know, throwing a tantrum or something, but I wanted kids that were teenagers and had their own personalities and their own storylines. And really what I wanted to do was show that this terrible thing the parents are doing and they think is a secret and they've sort of put into this little box away from their family, the effects of it actually ripple out and it ripples out into the family. It ripples out into the community. You can't do something terrible and think it's not going to affect people. Likewise, you can't do something good and think it won't affect people. The effect, your choices Mm -hmm. in life just have consequences. And I wanted to show that through the kids that even though they have no idea what their parents are doing, um, there are consequences. Yeah, absolutely. Because uh, I, I mean, I feel like early on, and pretty much most of the book, I thought Rory was just so bold. I'm like, this little kid <laughs> is like, I was waiting for him to turn into a serial killer. <laughs> right? I'm like, like, he is like his mother. Like, oh, my God, that's so scary. And then I start wondering, hmm, is this gonna mean that there's another book where he's a little serial killer and doing stuff? I don't know. <laughs> That's a good idea, <laughs> but I haven't written. I one, mean, <laughs> I didn't think about that. <laughs> That's funny. I mean, it's whole. I mean, they got the nurture and the nature. Uh, mm-hmm. You know, mm-hmm. they were raised by parents who are crazy, and they have the genes from the parents that are crazy. So, what will that mean for them? Right. Kind of thing. And it's funny you say that because a lot of the things Rory does are uh, are modeled after my own brother. <laughs> who was not not exactly like that but he Rory is very sarcastic and he's Mm -hmm. very clever in a devious way and my brother was like that too he would figure stuff out like that if he you know it whether just just taking advantage of being a teenager kind of a thing and not not that he would kill people but (laughs) that's Mm -hmm. that sort Mm -hmm. of teenage guy getting away with things sort of thing so that was sort of what was it was modeled after Oh, so was Jenna modeled after someone as well or? No, she wasn't. She was, um, she, she was not, she was just, just their second child and in a totally different Mm -hmm. position as a female, um, and dealing with what happens in the community and becoming afraid and also wanting to be like her mom. Unfortunately, she had her, for her, she had her dad's looks and she didn't look like her mom, but she wanted to look like her mom. So she had another whole teenage problem going on yeah i mean there were a lot of themes um in your book you know from the family drama obviously the serial killer (laughs) theme you know um little crazy kids you know you have infidelity and you know even mental illness i think is in there a little bit Mm -hmm. yep how did you kind of decide when tackling you know which type of mental illness did you want to deal with you know with therapy and all that you know I know you said you pants it but just so people know like who have trigger warnings and things like that like what can we kind of expect as far as the mental illness thing can you give us a little bit right I think it's um I think that comes about more um about a fear of what's going on in the community and a, a paranoia type of um, thing. I'm not sure what to call that as in terms of a mental illness. It's not, not like a a bipolar type of situation or um, even ADHD and not anything like that, but it's more a reaction to what's going on and and a feeling of being unsafe and feeling purely by what's been happening in the news and in their community. Yeah, in a severe way. It's kind of sad, actually. Mm-hmm. Like, oh. Yeah. So I don't know if you know this, but I love a good audiobook. I really do. So I was so glad to see that it was also released in audiobook at the same time. Yes. And um, did you get to ch- choose the narrator or they, how did that work for you? They sent me um, a sample of the person they thought was best. And it was the same person that read um, The Goldfinch by Donna Tartt. And as soon as I heard his voice, it had a good, really good resonance to it. And I agreed that that was a good person. So I I guess you could say I kind of had to say (laughs) they suggested the best person and I agreed. (laughs) 
Ah, okay. So you guys, the narrator is David Pitu. I think that's his mm-hmm. last name. Mm-hmm. And yeah, he's um good. I did listen to part of it on audiobook because, you know, I have to get a listen and see sure. what that was about. Sure. So absolutely. Um, so what can readers look forward to next from you? Um, another thriller. I'm in edits right now and it's... Um, I can't say too much other than hopefully it's just as uh, entertaining and disturbing as this one. That's, that's really what I try to do with my books. Um, as dark as this sounds, what we're talking about, this is not a bleak book. I don't look at it that way. I think there's a lot of dark humor in it and there's a lot of social commentary in it. And I, that's what I try to do. I want to entertain you and maybe make you think and maybe make you feel unsettled and a little disturbed, <laughs> but I'm not, these are not de- dark, depressing books in any way. No. And I would say mission accomplished to you. Great. <laughs> because that's how I felt. <laughs> Great. <laughs> yeah, little, pretty uh, much. Uh, uh, I think they the, they pitched it as a, I think Dexter meets Mr. and Mrs. Smith is how they talk about it. Um, I I think of the movies that are like American Beauty, which had a lot of social commentary in an old an old movie, and even American Psycho, which had the movie had so mm-hmm. much social commentary in it. So um, mm-hmm. I feel I look at things like that as inspirations. Okay, so one more question before we slide on into the lightning round: mm-hmm. If you were to pick, you know, a couple of actors, if you got an adaptation, do you have a few floating around in your mind that you might? Um, like to see well on the cover of the book and in the description um certainly the fact that she has red hair ha- has been established I, pretty thoroughly now so uh, automatically i think of red-haired actresses nicole kidman jessica chastain amy adams however it doesn't have to be a red i mean anybody can dye their hair red so it, it doesn't mm-hmm. have to be one of those three i secretly have a have a a fantasy casting of Idris Elba and Carrie Washington. So I think that could be a totally different twist on it. Um, I think anybody could do it as long as they were just really good at playing psycho. <laughs> oh yeah. Right. Believable psycho. Oh my gosh. Yeah, yeah, for sure. So is there anything else you'd like to share about my lovely wife before we close things out with the lightning round? Nope. Just that I hope people enjoy it and I love to hear from people hopefully you like it if you're gonna t- if you're gonna tell me how much you hate it i don't know if i want to hear from you but i you can, you can <laughs> <laughs> that's okay too though you can review it however you want to review it um just review it <laughs> just review it just review it yeah just have fun and don't take it too seriously for goodness sake for sure okay so let's do the lightning round and i know you know what it is but i'm gonna run the rules down really quickly for you okay So you just answer as many questions as you can. Some are book related, some are not. Some questions are open-ended, others you need to pick one or the other. The only rule that I have is that you must choose. You can't say neither or both. Okay. So you ready? Ready. Let's hit it. Okay. Physical books or eBooks? Physical. What's your go-to coffee order? Uh, Latte. Tattoos or piercings? Piercings. Hero or villain? Villain. Physical books or ebooks? Physical. Bookstore or library? Bookstore. Android or Apple? Apple. Where's your favorite place to read? Uh, outside. Salt or sweet? Sweet. Twizzler or red vine? Red vine. If you could pick one superpower, what would it be? To be invisible. Cliffhanger or tied in a bow ending? Cliffhanger. Windows or Mac? Mac. Netflix or Hulu? Oh, that's so tough. <laughs> <laughs> Time's up. Ah! <laughs> Thank God. <laughs> that's a hard pick, right? Right, because it depends on what you're watching at the moment. I mean, who knows? Yeah, I have both. A lot of people have both, but. Yeah, so do I. Yeah, it's hard choices, hard choices. Thankfully, one we don't have to make for real. Right. <laughs> I didn't even have to answer that one. <laughs> No, <laughs> I should have just jumped in and said Amazon Prime. <laughs> oh no! <laughs> I, honestly, I would say that's a bad choice, but okay, <laughs> probably, but just to be different. <laughs> yeah, that's awesome. Okay, so thank you so much for doing that, Samantha. It was really fun. Thank you. I had a great time. 
Absolutely. It was good to have you on. So everybody, be sure to follow Samantha on social media and pick up a copy of My Lovely Wife. The links for everything are below in the show notes, and I will catch you on the next book chat. Take care, everybody. If you enjoyed today's book chat episode and would like to show your support, there are a few things you can do. Head on over to Apple Podcasts and leave a positive five-star review. You can follow me on Twitter at Shelf Addiction. Most importantly, you can share this podcast with friends and family that enjoy all things bookish, including author interviews. Thank you for listening, and until next time, happy reading.